Newsnight and Newsnight Review now on BBC Two with Kirsty Walk and Mark Lawson. A routine reshuffle turns nasty. Robin Cook gets shunted out of the Foreign Office for Jack Straw. What did Mr Cook do to deserve it? Good evening. Tony Blair capped his historic election win last night with a swift and deadly reshuffle, replacing Robin Cook at the Foreign Office with Jack Straw, moving David Blunkett to the Home Office and putting more women in the Cabinet. Could the Prime Minister not trust Cook to deal with the Euro? I'll be asking Claire Short. And devastation for the Tories, confronted by the unprecedented prospect of a second full Labour term, the Conservatives are as good as leaderless tonight, desperately seeking a new direction after William Hague's resignation is following Haig the job from hell. The biggest vote last night wasn't Labour or Tory, it was the stay-at-home vote. Nowhere more so than in Liverpool. The government is just not in touch with reality at all. You know, they're not in touch with the way we work and the life that we live today. I just didn't think it was worth it. Praise God from her. And Ian Paisley is celebrating after his Democratic Unionists more than doubled the number of MPs they have at Westminster. I'm in Belfast where tonight the Good Friday Agreement and David Trimble have been dealt a huge blow by these election results. Can he and the peace process survive? And on Newsnight Review at 11.30, Tom Paulin, Alison Pearson and Alcorn Giovanni join me to discuss the father of political cartooning James Gilray, a revival of a play which changed the history of Broadway, a film which moves Midsummer Night's Dream to a US high school, and the new sculpture accused of making modern art transparent. First tonight, history will record last night's Labour victory as a watershed in British politics. A second term majority of 167, just 12 fewer MPs than last time. Labour has 413 seats. The Conservatives of 166, just one up from 1997. The Liberal Democrats an all-time high of 52 after Charles Kennedy's campaign exertions. And the other parties between them have 28. The 2001 election will also record a lack of participation in the democratic process which should shock politicians of every persuasion. 25% voted for Labour but 41% didn't vote at all. When Tony Blair spoke outside Downing Street today, he attempted to set the tone for the next Labour term. Inwardly he may have been ecstatic, outwardly he was measured, humble even, but he had one big surprise up his jumper. A reshuffle leaked long in advance claimed the unexpected scalp of Robin Cook, the Foreign Secretary. Here's Michael Crick. The Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready... Tony Blair is not the first Labour leader to win a landslide. Clement Attlee was, nor the only one to win twice. Indeed, Harold Wilson won four elections. But he's the first in the party's 100-year history to enjoy two landslides. Today, the Blairs, including young baby Leo, savoured their latest victory on the steps of Downing Street, amidst something of a paradox. Despite their second huge majority, the plain public disillusionment with politics, shown by yesterday's poor turnout, has forced Mr Blair to acknowledge that this time Labour must deliver more. It is a mandate for reform and for investment in the future and it is also very clearly an instruction to deliver. Tony Blair immediately faced that traditional puzzle, the post-election reshuffle. Though many answers are already been filled in or given less than cryptic clues over recent weeks. And just as important as the faces summoned to number 10 today was the expected reshaping of Whitehall Ministries. But the big surprise this evening was Robin Cook's demotion to leader of the House. The last man moved like that, Sir Geoffrey Howe, famously lasted only another year in office. But tonight, Mr Cook was stoical. I've served in the Commons now for almost 30 years. I've missed Parliament over the past four years when my work as Foreign Secretary has necessarily taken me around the rest of the world rather than around the Commons. I therefore was delighted when the Prime Minister asked me to come back home to Parliament 
and I look forward to playing a central part in overseeing the passage of the big programme of domestic legislation on which we've just received a mandate. And his replacement as Foreign Secretary is Jack Straw. He was once considered hostile to the Euro, but the Britain in Europe pressure groups say that in recent months he's mellowed and that they're happy with the switch. David Blunkett replaces Straw at the Home Office, promoted from education. No surprise there. The move was announced weeks ago in the pages of The Sun. He's charged with being just as tough on the police as he previously was on teachers. Prime Minister was very impressed by how David Blunkett beat down the opposition of the teaching unions to performance-related pay. And one of the targets of public sector reform and getting better value for money out of public services are going to have to be the police. Now, they are notoriously difficult to take on. Only very, very tough politicians dare do that. John Prescott moves from Environment and Transport to the Cabinet Office Coordination Post. He remains Deputy Prime Minister, but must know that the Cabinet Office's so-called enforcer role has become something of a graveyard job under Labour. Witness Jack Cunningham and Mo Molam. Downing Street insists Mr Prescott will fulfil the same role as Michael Heseltine when he was Deputy PM under the last Tory government. But it's hard to see Preza exercising the same clout within Whitehall as the highly experienced Heza did under John Major. Well, I think that they're doing everything they can to soothe his uh, tender feelings because quite clearly this is really a demotion dressed up as a promotion and they're, they're festooning him with uh, devices and, and badges and medals and uh, little bits of um, power, allegedly, in inverted commas. Gordon Brown remains Chancellor. Anything else would have been astonishing. But he won't be pleased his close ally, the Agriculture Minister Nick Brown, beleaguered by foot and mouth, is demoted to number two in the new Work and Pensions Department under Alistair Darling. Officially, Nick Brown is kicked out of the Cabinet, though he'll be allowed to attend meetings. The main Cabinet newcomer, again much heralded, is Estelle Morris, promoted from Schools Minister to run the new Department of Education and Skills, having played a successful leading role in the election campaign. Well, she is uh, a big experiment for this government. I mean, she's very efficient, very brisk. Uh, she can talk the talk. The big question is, at cabinet rank, can she walk the walk? Patricia Hewitt, the new Trade and Industry Secretary and Minister for Women, is another of four new females in the cabinet, bringing the total to six. And for the first time under Tony Blair, answering long-held complaints, women are now running major spending departments. Michael Crick, and there are three other appointments to mention. Stephen Byers moves from the DTI to become Secretary of State at the Department of Transport, Environment and the Regions. Charles Clark moves from the Home Office to the Cabinet as Labour Party Chairman. And John Speller leaves his junior job in Defence to become Transport Minister. Well, I'm joined now by a political editor, Martha Carney, but the story of the night has got to be Robin Cook. What happened? Well, I mean, this is a complete shock, I think. I saw Robin Cook at Millbank Tower last night at Labour Party headquarters, and he was doing a series of interviews all about the single currency, and there was no indication then at all that there was any plan to move him. I think it comes in the overall context of a much more radical reshuffle than anybody had thought. And I think this is part of what Tony Blair wants to do for his second term to say it's not just the work must go on, that kind of workmanlike phrase, but to do create a very different look for but, his cabinet. But the key thing in, in the next few months will be getting the tone on the euro right. Was there a danger that Robin Cook, you know, as he had done in the past, quite liked to go off and... Uh, you know, make his own announcements, do his own thing, and perhaps not deliver the political argument for the euro properly. Well, there had been stories of friction between him and Gordon Brown about exactly what the right tone was to set the debate, whether you should be making pro-European speeches or not, and criticism, too, of an interview that, indeed, he gave on Newsnight. But nonetheless, I mean, it is a shock. I mean, in the early days of Robin Cook's appointment, it, it was controversial. You may remember a rather messy divorce, then his trip to India, the whole fuss about the ethical foreign policy. But then there was a real sense that he had settled down, grown into the job. He was well-respected abroad. And he was respected abroad. abroad. Certainly. I met Madeleine Albright. She talked very highly of him. I mean, sometimes stories about a slightly abrasive manner within the Foreign Office himself, but he did seem yeah. secure. But I, I think it must be a sign of Tony Blair's own confidence in the size of his majority that he is prepared to reshuffle such a senior figure without worrying about any kind of But yet, comeback. again, just to, to carry on what you were saying about you know, is establishing a reputation abroad, if he had developed apparently a very good and earlier relationship with Colin Powell, um, you know, 
And they say it is more difficult to reshuffle a foreign, a foreign office minister because they build up relationships abroad and it actually could be quite a dodgy thing to do. Well, I think that just shows how much reliance mm. Tony Blair is now placing on Jack Straw, a very close political ally, who obviously sees as a very uh, sure pair of hands dealing with such a difficult area. But nonetheless, yes. this is a man whose reputation certainly was always for being a Eurosceptic. I mean, maybe there has yeah. been the Damascene conversion. Two, but the early jobs were for Eurosceptic. Labour MPs. Mm, indeed, indeed. So it'll be very interesting to see whether Jack Straw genuinely has uh, undergone a conversion or whether, in terms of actually um, being able to sell the referendum campaign, it helps to have somebody there who's sort of rather reluctantly saying, you know, I'm going to be dragged into this sort of, uh, you know, kicking and screaming. But in the end, I think it's the right thing for the country to do. We'll, we'll be hearing from you a little later, Martha. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm also joined now by Claire Short, who remains in the role of International Development Secretary, one of six women in the Cabinet. Claire Short, first of all, um, is it a good idea to put Jack Straw at Foreign Affairs? I think it's not for me to... I mean, each of us could make our own cabinet. It's for the Prime Minister to do that. I'm sure Jack will do the job, you know, enormously competently. I think myself, I mean, it is a surprise to everybody. But I think I was thinking, you know, during the course of the election, assuming we're back, having all the big figures in the same jobs make, is a danger of making government look stale as well. You need some movement plus some of the other things that Martha has said. But, but, of course, I don't know what's going on inside Tony's head. No, but um, you know, there, 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 was, there, you know, there was talk, as Martha said, that you know, he and Gordon Brown had a friction over where the euro was being presented. Um, in that case, the best thing to do is to move him out of the agenda, although he did say tonight that he's still going to be presenting the case for the euro, albeit will be in a very sidelined form, won't it? I don't know. I mean, you're tempting me to say, to say give you the answer you want. I'm tempting all... you for your natural honesty. No, but we're all speculating. I don't have any knowledge. I mean, this, it's true what Martha said. There was a lot of criticism of Robin at the beginning. Then things seemed to settle down. His grasp of all the detail of all the enormously complex European stuff, you know, everyone knew was second to none. But obviously, Tony's made this decision for this whole shape and balance of the government. Um, apparently, it was not very popular at the Foreign Office itself. I don't think... I can comment on that. But tell me about ethical foreign policy, because did he deliver on that or did he not? I mean, that was very much his instigation at the beginning. He set out this great stall, and yet we still got problems with arms to Indonesia, we still got problems with arms to Zimbabwe. He didn't deliver on it. I think the phrase was hung around his neck, mm. and it shows it's better to do what's right than say in advance, in a kind of a big sense, that you're going to achieve it. I think lots of our tightening up on arms sales and so on has, has gone a long way, and everyone seems to not notice Indonesia ceased to be a military dictatorship, became a democracy, it's very frail indeed. Being helpful to that new government was the right thing to do. So I think Robin made lots of strides, but when you said we're going to have an ethical foreign policy, and given that you can't make the world perfect, he was going to be taunted. It was unfortunate. It, it showed, a, in a sense, uh, a, a lack of a grasp of the complexity of the job. No one would say Robin lacks grasp. Robin is a very sharp guy and he grasps detail. That's not Robin's problem. But uh, under no stretch of the imagination as leader of the House of Commons in any way comparable for that job, it is a humiliation for him. It's a change. Moving on to other territory, I mean, the heat is absolutely on Tony Blair now to deliver in the next term, isn't it? Because he has been given this extraordinary second term, full second term, the first uh, of a Labour government. And People are so unhappy with the state of the National Health Service that he has to do something radical. My own view on this is that it's the consequence of what we did in the first two years, which was about making the economy strong. And it means the extra money for improving public services has only been going for two years. So people quite reasonably are impatient. I think the underlying thing, of course, is that, that Britain is changing. That everyone thought the people were obsessed with questions of level of tax, but they're not. People want good quality, high quality public services for all, and that became a central theme of the election. But I don't think it's embarrassing the pressure to go on delivering in public services. It's very much a Labour agenda. That's what we want to do. And the money is flowing now, and it's doable. That's my own view. But it, it, it's doable uh, in, in the short term to make some short term fixes in the National Health Service, but. No, 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 not just. I mean, the, the increase in the spending that's going in is enormous. I could go through details of the 
GPs practices that have been improved in my own constituency, what's gone on in my local hospital, that's going on up and down the land. There's more to do, but there's big change taking place and improvements taking place, and they will go but, on. But, it's, it, but it's, it's a change in philosophy because I, I could counter with lots of arguments about health service, uh, um, doctor surgeries and, and hospitals which aren't in good condition. Yes, of course, and, but, but no, no, but please. The, the point is it will not go along in the same way because even Tony Blair is talking about the increase of private involvement in the NHS. There is a discussion to be had about funding of the NHS and clearly it's not going to be through higher taxation. Well, I think this or is private it? engagement thing has been hyped mm. and hyped. Let's see in practice. I mean, it was always the private sector always who built the buildings. It's always the private sector that produced the pharmaceuticals and so on. And, you know, the, the PFI, we all know, was resisted by Unison, but has led to the building of more hospitals. So this could be something highly contentious, or it could be more of the same. I don't think it's as problematic as is being suggested at the moment. Before I finish, I want to ask you about uh, the position of women in the Cabinet. We heard a slightly patronising uh, Mr Kavanagh talking about whether they cut it in the Cabinet or not in a, cert a certain role. But and there was a problem during the campaign. I think it because we haven't got all the posts yeah. yet. There, there was a problem in the campaign because remember that day in which uh, you know the, the, the male journalist at the press conference said we were not going to ask questions. Jackie Ashley from New Statesman asked a question and then Robin, uh, Gordon Brown did the most embarrassing thing of replying for Estelle Morris. Um, does he have to do a lot better with women in senior spending positions and senior roles in a Labour government? I actually think that women are very good at politics because they go for less, for less blah and more for getting on with it. But the boys club that is the Westminster media lobby don't think women politicians are proper politicians. And so there's a game in the media that's played about politics that excludes women, who I think are, are largely excluded from the Westminster lobby too. And I think that's just two groups of boys reflecting each other. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much indeed. Well, following the Tories' crushing defeat, William Hig carried out his own one-man reshuffle this morning and fell on his sword in the summer sunshine. But did Tony Blair do for William Hig, or was the Conservative leader the architect of his own downfall, with a campaign that centred, some would say, obsessively on the euro? Again, here's our political editor, Martha Carney, assessing a party on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Twenty-four hours can be an eternity in politics. This time last night, William Hague was still protesting that the polls were wrong. But after four years of leadership and four weeks of frenetic campaigning, he failed to dent Labour's lead, and so was swift to take the blame and resign. No man or woman is indispensable, and no individual is more important than the party, and thereby the democratic health of our country. I've led this party for four years, have always considered it a great privilege, and have actually enjoyed every single day. I believe strongly, passionately in everything that I've fought for. But it's also vital for leaders to listen and parties to change. I believe it's vital that the party be given the chance to choose a leader who can build on my work, but also take new initiatives and hopefully command a larger personal following in the country and I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party when a successor can be elected in the coming months. Now the Conservatives are trying to work out why things went so badly wrong. The reasons MPs settle on will determine whom they choose for their new leader. Make no mistake about it. The manoeuvring over William Hague's replacement has already begun. Westminster is full of rumour. Much of it centred around Michael Portillo. There had been a time when friends say that he definitely wasn't interested in the leadership. But now the circumstances are very different. There's an open door. He wouldn't have to mount a challenge and possibly fall prey to Heseltine's law. He who wields the knife will never wear the crown. One shadow cabinet member who's thought to support Michael Portillo is highly critical of the way the Tory campaign focused on its core vote with issues like the euro and asylum instead of focusing on health and education. Any uh, political party uh, that wants to win an election has to reach out beyond its core supporters. It isn't enough for a, a conservative party in opposition to talk mainly to the readers of the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail. Uh, one lesson I think perhaps we still need to learn from Tony Blair is that when he became Labour leader in 1994, he did 
he was prepared to almost confront some of the traditional Labour supporters and force them to recognise that you've got to reach out to a much wider audience to attract the floating voters. He believes that the party needs to modernise in order to avoid another devastating defeat. There are different lifestyles, different uh, patterns of, of uh, behaviour. Uh, I believe that the core principles still apply to those, but we need to talk about them in, in new language and in ways which really uh, people find relevant to their daily decisions. The kind of philosophy that Michael Portillo espouses? I think Michael's uh, philosophy certainly does uh, address many of these concerns. I think that the party still has a bit of an identity crisis. Some people think that a, a rehashed, pure Thatcherite agenda would actually lead to the restoration of our fortunes. I think the world has moved on. Sex, drugs, rock, rock and roll, these social dimensions now matter much more in influencing voting intention. I think the future of the party lies in Eurosceptic social liberalism, and I think that's where a character will emerge. If that character turns out to be Michael Portillo, he could get support from an unexpected quarter, Ken Clark. There are those who would still like Clark himself to stand, including tonight, the former Tory chairman Chris Patton, talking on any questions. If the Conservative Party is going to stand a chance of recovering from this appalling hammering uh, which it's taken over the last uh, day, if it's going to stand a chance of recovering, then it has to include uh, in its councils the views of those who've been in the mainstream of conservatism for years when, I just happen to add, we used to win elections. But friends of Ken Clark say it's unlikely he'll stand because he'd do worse than last time and that's why he may lend his support to Michael Portillo. But the very fact that Michael Portillo could attract support from the pro-European centre-left has led to deep suspicion amongst traditional Thatcherites in the party. Some of the criticism is coded, in effect an attack on his role as Shadow Chancellor. The, the U-turn on the tax guarantee or the apparent change on the tax guarantee was just one part of the problem that we didn't really get over. Uh, that we were very strong on tax and spending in the right way, that we could deliver better on both sides of the account. Others are less guarded. Uh, well, I, I uh, uh, am not sure uh, quite where Michael is going to on a number of issues. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with uh, what I think is uh, an excessive reliance that uh, he and others are now placing on something called inclusiveness. Uh, I don't think that that wins elections. I'm not even sure that I know what it means in policy terms. And my fear is that uh, if we try to make ourselves look more and more like the other political parties, that won't win us any votes at all. I think we've got to offer a distinctive product We've got to tell people what we stand for, and then we've got to challenge them to support us. That, I believe, is the way that we're going to recover, not by being a, a carbon or pale copy of other political parties. He has one man in mind to turn round Conservative fortunes, the former chair of the Public Accounts Committee. I'm going to urge my colleague David Davis uh, to be a candidate. Uh, I know David well, I respect him enormously, uh, and I think, uh, uh, from what I know of him, that he has the sort of views and the sort of qualities uh, that should be on offer in the leadership. Obviously, this is a very disappointing result. There's one crucial endorsement which any candidate from the authoritarian wing of the party would like, that of Lady Thatcher. It's thought Anne Widdicombe may stand, but Ian Duncan Smith is more likely to get the support of the former Prime Minister. Another of her chosen has a clear view of where the party should go. Andrew Rossendale, one of the few Tory successes from last night, the new MP for Romford. There's nothing extreme about wanting to keep your own currency. If you give away control of your own financial affairs, you give away control of everything. And that's the point. So our policy on that is absolutely right. I think where we, where we perhaps went wrong is that we weren't clear enough. I think that the policy of saying, well, we're against the euro, we're going to keep the pound, but only for a few years. I don't think that was really understandable. I think most people didn't grasp what we were saying and they didn't trust us. Politicians in all parties have got to try and talk about what interests people and not what interests politicians. Uh, I think there's another danger for us, which is if we find a subject on which the majority of people agree with us, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right issue to campaign on all the time. 
four years on, the Conservative Party is in no better position than after its 1997 defeat. And there's still no consensus on just how the party can forge a recovery. Martha Carney. Well, a little earlier this evening, I spoke to the Conservative grandee and former Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine. I asked him how he'd felt watching last night's events unfold. It was pretty shattering. I've fought for the Tory party in every general election since 1951, 50 years. And uh, to see my party sort of facing meltdown was, was tragic. Uh, it, was, it was rather like the Labour Party in 1983. And I just hope that uh, we're not in any way minded to go through the experience of changing our leader three times and waiting 14 years before we pull ourselves together and get back to power. What do you think were Hague's major problems? I think that the first uh, major po problem was to centre on a group of issues which could be packaged uh, under the label of right wing. Uh, there was first of all the Eurosceptic uh, argument and uh, then it was associated with asylum seekers, a foreign land, um, law and order. And when people wanted to talk about their concern over health and education and public transport, we got ourselves into a debate about whether we were going to cut taxes by 8 billion or 20 billion. Uh, and so you couldn't be talking easily about improving quality in public services when everyone knew what you were really trying to do was reduce taxes. Now, I knew there were arguments and answers to these, but the, the overall image, and I think that uh, though William is a, one of the, is probably the best public speaker to lead the Tory party since Churchill and a very able parliamentarian. He is not that easy and, ha and, and comfortable with the cathode ray tube. I, I don't know what it is, but somehow or other there is a, 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 the, the projection of his personality it doesn't easily come through. The country we live in, is it a country the Conservatives understand anymore? Well, that is the, the next and very difficult issue because the fact is that this country is changing very significantly. Uh, if I just name three obvious examples that are pivotal in dealing with the attractiveness of a party to the centre ground. The first is the whole issue of marriage, family relations, divorce, single parents, and all of that. And traditionally, the Tory party, uh, understandably, has argued for the, the family values. But today, the more you do that, the more a seriously large minority in this country shakes their head and says, he's not talking about me. Secondly, you have all the complications of multicultural and multi-ethnic uh, minorities which are becoming a mainstream part of our society. And thirdly, you have the whole uh, social mores change associated with homosexuality, the gay vote. Now, all of these things are unavoidable and the, the dilemmas associated with them are unavoidable if one is going to make oneself a credible party. If you're saying, though, the Conservatives should be socially liberal, isn't there a danger that that will create another schism, just like the Euro? I, I don't think you want to talk about being socially liberal. I don't think anyone out there in the bull and bush is saying, are you socially liberal? I think you have to be seen to understand and to be concerned about the problems that affect and the aspirations of the various groups that I'm talking about. They matter in society. There is a thing called society. And we've got to be, in the Conservative Party, able to talk with ease and in a relaxed way about the interests of all groups if we're going to appeal to the centre ground. Now, if that means that uh, the leader of the Tory party has to actually bring his activist, right-wing, traditional voters along with him, well, that's what leaders are for. If you look, though, that people are being lined up as potential leaders, can you imagine Anne Widdicombe pursuing that kind of agenda? Well, I don't think we want to start deciding who at this stage. What is absolutely fundamental is for the, the broad church that is the Tory party to recognise the answer to this question. Do you want to win power? And if you want to win power, it's almost impossible to do it in one parliament now with the size of the majority. But if you want to win power, you've got to understand the need to speak for a broad coalition of interests. And that requires a degree of sophistication and a degree of tolerance about other people's views. And you have to start with the euro. If the Tory party wants to tear itself apart by alienating the Europhiles, who are a very important part of Tory opinion, and pursuing a Eurosceptic agenda, then I tell you, you can write off the next general election. I know you think it's too early to talk about the leadership, but is Kenneth Clark your man for the job? 
Well, I believed in 1997 that he was the man for the job. He was the man the party wanted, and it was only the intervention of Mrs. Thatcher to stop Ken Clark that turned the party to William Hague, and look where that's got us. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you look at what the British public want, the British public, they want Ken Clark. He is head and shoulders ahead of any other leading Conservative in the House of Commons at the moment. If you ask the activists of the Conservative Party, they want Michael Portillo. And uh, Michael is a very fine politician, and I worked very closely with him. But the fact is, his popularity rests with the activists of the Tory party, who are an ageing and a minority group. Michael Heseltine. Well, perhaps the biggest investigation of the election will be into the failure of the voters to turn out. Or perhaps it should be into the failure of the politicians to give them enough reason to vote. The turnout was 58%, the lowest in 80 years. But that figure hides some pretty shocking detail. We spent the past two days in Liverpool, where in one of the constituencies, just 34% of the voters voted. The worst turnout in the United Kingdom. Jackie Long's been trying to find out why. I don't know, small businesses, they should give more help to small businesses. All I Catherine Kavanagh would be a good catch for either Labour or the Tories. Um, a self-made businesswoman at just 31, yeah, she pays her taxes, so quite a lot of them, she says, and employs 15 people. But neither party got her vote. In fact, no one got it. From a Labour family background, she scoffs at the notion she didn't vote because she's happy with the status quo. That is rubbish. It's the, it's the other way around. A lot of people have just given up. I don't know anybody that votes anyone of my age group. None of them vote. None of them. I'd say from the age of 25 to, say, 35. They just don't vote. Hardly surprising, then, that on the streets of Liverpool this morning, talk of landslides and historic second terms seemed a world away. Here, this is an election which barely seems to have registered. Tony Blair says in giving him this victory, the people have sent out a very clear, very strong message. But what message will he take from places like this? In Liverpool, half the electorate didn't even bother to vote. In this city centre constituency of Riverside, only 34% of people voted. That's the lowest turnout in the country. Is it a sign that everyone's satisfied with what they've got or that they're totally disengaged from the whole process? All oh, very nice. OK, hold still. Like, keep Photographer and model scout Helen Tinner spent yesterday working rather than voting. None of the politicians have convinced her. She says she knows their game. We have girls like these girls, for example, they're interested to get into modelling. Now, we tell them how to look, how to walk, what to wear. And I know that it's exactly the same with, with politicians. They're, they're basically told how to look, what to say. And from that point of view, it's a fix. And you know that there's nothing there. These people are just puppets, isn't it? I mean, everyone knows that they're puppets, don't they? Yeah? Push your foot in for me. Across the city in Kirkdale, one woman, at least, was brought on message by the pleas to get out and vote. For Faye Davis, a single mother with no job, to not vote would in some way be a luxury. She needs politics to work. She needs it to make a difference for her and for her son. I want to be counted for the decisions to make for my son's future. I want my vote to count and I want him to grow up and know that his vote will count as well. And while Faye's vote was being counted, the blue bar in Liverpool's fashionable Albert Dock area was filling up for the evening. A varied mix of young professionals and entrepreneurs offered equally diverse reasons for not voting. But in this traditional Labour heartland, bitter disappointment at the last five years seemed key. When I voted last time, I really had a sense that I was taking part in something that was very politically significant for the country, that we'd had these terrible, terrible thatch years and that this Labour sweep was going to take the nation and take us forward to something amazing and fantastic and I don't know why I fell for it, but I did fall for it and I've kind of lost my enthusiasm and I've lost my enthusiasm for politics and I've lost my enthusiasm for belief in change. With such huge numbers not voting this time, is there's a message the politicians now can't ignore? You know, you would hope so, but I don't think it is. I don't think the politicians care. They, the only reason they go on TV and say, everybody vote, is because that's what they expect them to do. 
And that's, that, that's what they expect, that's what the people expect the politicians to do. The message is that every, there's a mass cynicism about politicians, basically. I mean, I wouldn't have William Hague in my house for a cup of tea. I wouldn't have Tony Blair in my house for a cup of tea. Back in the hair salon this morning, Catherine gets a telling off for wasting her vote. A rare Tory in the area, though, her customer does share some of her worries about the nature of politics today. For the first time for a long, long time, there doesn't seem to be very much in it. You know, a lot of Labour policies, uh, Conservative policies, and um, so really there's not such a difference between the Labour and Conservatives, not like it used to be. And if the people of Liverpool and other places like it are to be convinced they should make the effort to vote next time, clearly that's something which will have to change. Jackie Long. Well, the Republic of Ireland has had its own political shock today when voters gave a resounding no to the enlargement of the European Union. The Treaty of Nice, which paves the way for reform, must be ratified by all EU countries by 2002. Only Ireland was required to hold a referendum and has proved an embarrassment for the Irish government. Liz McKean's in Dublin. It's an improbable coalition of desperados, but the no camp has imposed its will on the Irish government. Leading the way was Ireland's one-time Queen of Europe, Dana, an MEP, famous for winning the Eurovision Song Contest and now for bringing together anti-abortionists, pacifists and Republicans.